Thank you, everybody, and most thank you to Troy and Tommy. Thrilled to have you guys here. This is not just any old webinar, and this is not just any old No More Week. We are kicking off No More Week 2023, which is also the 10th anniversary of No More, which is pretty crazy to anyone who was there from the beginning. Um, and in large part, you know, Troy, you were there pretty early on when Ann and I sat in in the office with you and started talking about it a long time ago. So thank you. Um, this is really, for those of you out there, this is really intended to be a conversation with Troy and Tommy. But if you don't know them, I'm going to spend just a couple minutes introducing them and then we're going to launch right in. So Troy Vincent Sr. Uh, in the yellow is currently the Executive Vice President of Football Operations at the NFL. This means he shepherds the full lifestyle of players and the game from youth to NFL legends, but that's not all. He's implemented programs that focus on wellness and mental health, suicide prevention, stigma change, domestic violence, sexual assault prevention, and he worked closely, closely with the clubs, the players, and legends on social justice initiatives in the communities across the nation. Across the nation. Troy was a first round draft pick and had a 15 year uh, pro career including five pro ball appearances and was selected all pro three times. Tommy is a multi-hyphenate dynamic visionary dedicated to providing women, children, and families with the tools they need to transform their lives and purpose by promoting the healing properties of cooking, the power of sharing personal experiences, and the value added to collective communities through the exchange of ideas and direct distribution of resources. That sounds very cool. <laughs> Uh, Tommy is also a leader in the national movement to end domestic violence, serving as the chair of the National Domestic Violence Hotline Board of Directors, advocating for shelter funding, crisis counseling, safety planning, and other supportive services, and driving curriculum development. So now you know the, the amazing uh, pedigree of the people we have with us today. We really want to focus on healthy relationships. And as the title says, how one's past contributes to the present when it comes to life with a partner. Uh, this will be a conversation, a chat amongst the three of us. And if there's time, we will take appropriate and relevant questions from everybody listening. So to start, can you just share a little bit about, and I don't, we, each of you start, you see you can work this out between the two of you, um, <laughs> why this issue is important to you. Tom? So for myself personally, um, I am a survivor of domestic violence. I endured a relationship all throughout high school that culminated with uh, the guy I was dating at the time trying to throw me off of a bridge. Um, and beyond that point in my life, I didn't talk about it because I'll be honest with you, I didn't recognize abuse the way that it is recognizable to me today because I grew up in a family culture where where domestic violence was prevalent. And so for me, the relationship that I was in, it it equated to love. That's how you love someone. When you care about them, you harm them, you hurt them because it's it's that emotion coming out. Mm -hmm. And so for for many years I did not talk about it. And Troy was very vocal about his story. And then there was just one day where I really felt like you know, I really can add to this conversation. I'm a survivor and not only am I, am I a survivor, but I had really transitioned to the space where I was thriving. Mm -hmm. And so for me, this, the whole point and why this is so important to me is because I want to be a part of turning up the volume and normalizing the conversation and not the behavior. Mm -hmm. For myself, I was just introduced to violence. I would say violence against women. I was seven, eight years old and I, I was woke up to the sounds of the night in the night, the middle of the night of my mother being beaten or abused. And that went on for most of my adolescence life through my teenage years. And as a teenager going to, I think I was about the age of 16 and I just felt like I wanted to do something different. I didn't want to be what I saw. I didn't want, I didn't want any parts of that life. And I just felt like, Hey, how can I use my own platform to further educate myself and I just began working with local organizations in the city of Trenton mm -hmm. to educate myself, one, to comfort women and some young kids and young boys that might have either experienced it physically or actually saw it. So right. that's 
it was at that particular time where I felt like, and I made a commitment to my mom for the rest of my life. I'll be an ally. I'll be an advocate for violence against women and young girls. Mm -hmm. You said at that young an age, you started in, in your teens really to go and learn about it. Age of 16, Salvation Army. At that same year, I gave my life to Christ. And at the time, there weren't, we call it like prevention center or safe home. Right, right, right. It was either YMCA, Teen mm -hmm. Post, sure. and at the time, the Salvation Army, which was, uh, they, we had one location that was about a, two blocks from my house. Right. So I used to go over there because that was the shelter. Uh -huh, um, uh -huh. Families were displaced in the city of Trenton at that time. We're talking early 70s, mid 70s, mm -hmm. early 80s at that time. And I used to just travel over there. The The gentleman and the folks that ran the organization was was familiar with me. I was there often. <laughs> so they just kind of let me in and began teaching me. And I just began look, looking and just volunteering a lot of time in the city. And then I went to when I was uh, a student athlete at the University of Wisconsin, those same things traveled with me. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. I mean, it's also healing you, obviously, on some level, right? I mean, you were learning, but you were also starting to heal. or Yes. Working. And that was one of my ways of, I saw pain not only in my mother, but right. being able to see other victims and asking that God, hey, you know, they can't handle that pain. Won't you transfer that over to me in my own way? Mm -hmm. I can deal with it. And what I would do is just walk around the city dribbling the basketball, like miles and miles and miles around the city, just dribbling, thinking about the sounds, thinking about what I just witnessed or what someone just told me. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's really intense. Um, Tommy, you know, you knew about this. You knew this about Troy when you first got together, question mark? So no, I did not. Um, I was not familiar with Troy's story, nor was he familiar with mine. Um, and so as you can imagine, we came into the relationship carrying over abusive traits. And I know that may sound strange, but we, when you're in an environment where abuse is prevalent, you learn that behavior. And so it was something that we had to navigate and figure out even prior to us really having the conversation about what were the triggers and things that we needed to avoid or at, at minimum have conversations about so that we had a full understanding of why this was problematic for our relationship. Mm -hmm. How did it, um, how did it come up though? In other words, I, I, I have, um, I've had the privilege of hearing you sort of tell the story of how it sort of started to come up for you guys that you realized that you were coming at it from two different points of view in term, I mean, without going into detail, but it was, it's an interesting, you know, it, it's an interesting juxtaposition of where you each come to the relationship from. Absolutely. So I actually, I, I think it's important to share some of the details because okay. when you don't recognize that these you're carrying in, and I don't, it's not even baggage. It's, it's literally, these things are inside of you now because you mm -hmm. absorbed it in the environments that you grew up in. And so for myself, I learned that love was combative, that love was, you know, beyond just having an argument that it was physical and that if there was something going on that was that you didn't agree with, we need to have a conversation and not a soft one. You know, we need to get in each other's face and we need to work this thing out. And Troy was on the opposite of the spectrum he was more inclined to walk away. And so for me, that was extremely problematic because what I knew to resolve conflict actually created more conflict, but what I thought was going to resolve it, that was not how he had um, his protection mechanism was to just shut down and to retreat. And mine was for us to, you know, we going to duke this thing out. And so it was interesting for quite, a bit. No, it, it was, <laughs> you know, when I think back on it, pretty, actually pretty funny, but I just wanted to know parts of it. So again, I'm a teenager. I'm going to, I'm finishing up high school and college. And as I was courting women, just due to my own learnings, I was able to, to at least some kind of way, shape or form, I would have a feeling that this person either, 
either had been abused or in, in, in engaged. And I was just like, I want no parts of that. Sure. Like I'm not in the hollering. I'm not in the screaming. My motto was there's nothing to get me to take my temperament to get to that level of either hollering at you, raising my voice at you, or, you know, never even crossed my mind to physically sure. abuse you. So what would I do? I think we need to, you know, maybe it's time for me to go home mm -hmm. and I would just walk away. And that was problematic <laughs> to, <laughs> to, to Tom. And then we just began, but I was unapologetic around about my position. Sure. So I was out front. So was I, by the way. Yes. Yeah. Meaning just my own personal journey. I was just, I told my mom, I was going to do this. I'm not going to walk away. And as I, again, me and Tommy engaged, and I just think it was a timing. It was Tommy felt comfortable mm -hmm. at a place where she was in her life, because I think everyone has to come to that place where you're, you're okay with being vulnerable and mm -hmm. sharing your story. And it just, you know, when Tommy was, uh, when she was ready to do that, she did so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You must have explained a lot. Were you, and, but you still didn't know his story, right? No. Well, he started, he started um, sharing it at some point in time in our relationship. So I would hear him sharing and I would be like, oh, that's interesting. But I still hadn't right, really sat down yeah. to really consider my experience. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, it it wasn't something that I was suppressing. It just was, for me, it really was just a way of life. It was normal. So normal. Mm -hmm. And so I was not thinking of it from that perspective. And I want to say, um, and I want to share this piece in regards to the communication and the relationship and how, you know, it, it became a point where it was really necessary for us to really start engaging in communication. I did not lose that piece of me. And when I say that piece of me, that fight, mm -hmm. I think it's important because sometimes, you know, there's this desire or this thought process that you need to abandon what you've learned in mm -hmm. life and ver versus abandoning that piece of me, because I value the fighter in me. Mm -hmm. And I had to learn how to discipline the fighter in me so that when Troy and I were engaging in those conversations and talking things out that I made sure that my position was heard and walking away and not having a conversation still was not acceptable to me. And that was where he and I had to come to an agreement on because that doesn't solve anything either. Not communicating and not having the conversation just allows for that, whatever that situation is to stay dormant until it comes back up again. And right. so I remained steadfast and no, we're going to talk about it. I just lost that piece of me or, you know, gave that piece of me up where I thought I had to go upside his head or scream right. and shout and cuss and do those things to be heard. I could right. do that just by simply being me. Right. But that was probably helpful for you too, Troy, though, right? I mean, learning to confront it a little bit as, a, I mean, in a healthy way, as opposed to. Yes. And again, my, my position was based off of what I was seeing with Tom on the other side, like to have a productive conversation, we were not going to have a productive conversation right. Right. with some of the things that was, you know, I, I would use the term Tom was hot mm -hmm. and we're not going to have a productive conversation right. with the volatility with whether it's pitch and voice hand gestures. And it was just like, once we both got to a place where we can sit and communicate, then I think I, I, be I believe that that was when we began to accept each other's way of communicating and really what was triggers and what wasn't triggers so that frankly, we can work together and then not be combative. Right. But you didn't, did you necessarily know her story when you first came to that? In other words, you know, you, you made a comment earlier that Tommy felt more comfortable over the course of the relationship where you sort of re came to a realization, Tommy, that that's not normal, right? What you had experienced. Yeah. And so, um, or shouldn't be. And so uh, it, it, it just is always interesting, you know, look, everybody realizes things about their partners as they spend more time with them. If you live with them and, you know, first year and jokes, first year of marriage, it's like, whoa, um, you know, you're sort of really learning about who you're with. 
but I, I just, I wonder, I mean, once you, maybe I'm just pontificating, but once you know that about your partner, you know, it, it just changes, it, it just changes how you approach things, right? I mean, you yes. knew what was going on with him, Tommy, but he didn't necessarily know what was happening with you. So it was, it's an interesting, uh, you know, an interesting construct in the relationship. And, and that was, that was the way it literally played out. And I look at it as every person comes to a place in their life's journey when they are comfortable. And I think that's important for anyone supporting anyone that's a hero now in this space that is choosing to share mm -hmm. or share someone else's story. Tom was just at that place where she heard me share and she was just at a place to say, I can add value to my own personal journey was, was significant. And she was just at that place in her life and I think we have to give everyone that space mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. be ready when they say they're ready to share. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. no, for sure. I think it's, I, I, I want to, I want to point out that there's, there's a couple of things because we're married, right. And we're getting to know each other. So there's some things that came along with just being married, right. Then there were, there were other aspects of our relationship that were as a result of the abuse Troy and I experienced growing up. Mm -hmm. And so being able to hear the story just gave understanding that wasn't present before. So we were working and navigating blind right. because right. we didn't have these pieces or that, you know, it was like the pieces to the puzzle to understand why is it so important for me to be heard? Mm -hmm. Why is it so important for me to not feel any aspect of anything that felt like control? You know, mm -hmm. like it could be Troy being kind to me and, and doing something nice for me, but how it landed on me would feel like control. And, you know, so in my head, I'm like, you're not going to control me because mm -hmm. everything, the undercurrent of everything for me was the abuse. And once I started talking about it and sharing my story and I did counseling, mm -hmm. I was able to really have an understanding personally, like, hey, this is what this, this is why you feel this way when this happens. Right. So it, it gave me the information I needed so that I could pause and mm -hmm. say, okay, what is my goal here? What do I desire for Troy to understand? And how can we move from this point to get to the solution? So mm -hmm. being able to share my story and also receiving the help that I needed for me personally, having absolutely nothing to do with Troy, just me wanting to be the best version of myself possible mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. free from the shackles mentally that victims of abuse get along the way. I needed to do some work. I did that. And then it gave me the understanding I need to be able to articulate to Troy. These are some things that are important to me. And I need for you to hear me on this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Jane, it's I also would... helpful that you had Troy. I mean, you had someone like Troy, right? Who was there ready to receive it. Jane, I would also say for any relationship, I mean, we were young, late teens, early 20s. And sometimes we don't remind ourselves that we all, we, both parties, bring in past experiences mm -hmm. to the table of the new relationship. Sometimes they're discussed, sometimes things are discussed, sometimes things aren't discussed. But every relationship, good, bad, or indifferent, you are bringing in your past experiences yep. to the new relationship. Now, how you go about discussing those things, it's up to the couple. Mm hmm mm hmm no, that's really important. Now, we were talking, if anybody heard us before, you have five children, correct? Five children, how you, grandchildren. How did, how did you, um, how do you, how and when did you start to talk to your kids about these issues? People, you know, I have three boys. People ask me that sort of all the time. And I'm, I'm curious asking, now asking you, you guys, you know, when did you share your, how did, how or did it weave into your, the way you, you, you deal with and dealt with and shared with your kids? So I, I personally parented from that lens, even though when my kids were little and I didn't share my story when they couldn't right. comprehend it, of course. I parented from that lens in respect to how 
uh, my sons treated my daughters, how my daughters interacted with their brothers. Like I was intentional about how we resolve conflict. I also did not tolerate um, any love should not hurt intentionally. And so, you know, when, when children are young and they're having disputes, you may, the first reaction may be to say something that you know is going to hurt that person. That's not love. And so those were great opportunities for us to have those conversations to talk about why that's important and why we have to be each other's champions at all the, all times, even when you're upset, okay, walk away, but you're not going to use your words to scar your sister or your brother. And then once they got old enough where I felt like they could understand and it wouldn't create a weight for them, an unnecessary weight for them to carry. Cause you know, you got to be careful with that as well. Like they're kids and they yeah. shouldn't have to carry the burden of my pain. Sure. And so when the time was appropriate, we had those conversations and just making sure that we were in a position to be a valued resource for them. Like I want my children to feel comfortable talking to us about anything, mm -hmm. even if they're in a situation where they're in a relationship and things aren't feeling, um, well, I, I'm not even going to say feeling because for me growing up, I was feeling hurt but that was love to me. So it's not even about feelings, but recognizing behavior that is inappropriate. I want them to be able to talk about that, even if they're the ones giving that inappropriate behavior. Mm -hmm. And I would say our parent from, we had both parent from that same lens of frankly, just trying to be an example for our daughters and then the boys where it was twofold. I can tell you, I can show you better than I can tell you. Mm -hmm. So as they got older and matured to Tommy's point of them being able to actually process, but kids learn by seeing. Yep. So I know what I can be by what I see. So that parenting from that lens, in particular, the young ladies of what they should expect. And I hope that I've always been a good model for my two daughters of what they should expect in a male or mm -hmm. man or their mm -hmm. partner, in particular, a man, because they saw it from their daddy. They didn't see their daddy harm their, their mother. They saw their, their daddy care for their mother from just the respect, from the little things, from opening the door, to holding her hand, to hugging, so trying to be a model. And then I had separate conversations with my boys mm -hmm. outside of, here's the way uh, men should should act in a relationship. I'm big on permission. Like mm -hmm. as you start getting into this space where you think you want to explore or you think you want to date, it's imperative that you talk to the parents. Do, are the parents aware that you are in talking to their daughter? Are they aware? And if they're not, then you need to, that was one of my kind of non-negotiables. Mm -hmm. The parents need to know. Do the parents know that you're either going over their house or that you two are seeing each other, or you're talking and communicating in this like manner in school. Mm -hmm. So at that same time, I mean, that's every day with the boys. And then just sharing them with them, there should be nothing to take you to a level where you're raising your voice, or that would take you to a level, it doesn't matter what the situation is, mm -hmm. where you would harm a young lady. Mm -hmm. So Outside of the overall, we have examples of something shows up and we we learned one, I can share my own personal experience, but as they engaged and we saw things around television that became national stories, okay, mm -hmm. let's talk about it. Right. Right. But those are those are those are ways in parenting through that lens of and my boys, I'm a little bit, I would say I'm a little bit tougher. And my young ladies, I share, this is unacceptable. And you have to be able also pairing and parenting from a lens of you got to be okay with coming to your parents about talking about these things, not afraid. Now I'm mature. At one juncture, I was, if somebody did this to you, to my daughter, um, I'm probably want to inflict harm, <laughs> but I've matured. To, <laughs> I'm at a different place as a pop pop now, right. <laughs> saying, hey, but you can't accept it. And you have to, your children have to know that you're not going to go from zero to 100 in the event that they share with you that they may be experiencing things that are kind of out of context or things that we're against. 
right? Or perpetrating for that matter, if they realize, right, yes. that they've done something. Yes. And I think, you know, it, whether it's a, one of the, your daughters or your sons, right? Because we know, you know, certainly abuse can go both ways. Um, it's interesting because of course it's generational, right? Mm -hmm. And you both have made, I remember Troy, when we talked early on, you made a very, and you said it here, made a very conscious decision to, to end that generational abuse on with you, right? Like that was not going to continue down your, your side of the family tree. And ultimately, Tommy, so did you. Um, how, and, and of course, you, you reserve the right to say, I don't want to talk about that, but how, how did it um, play out with your families? I'm just curious. Like when you, when you sort of realized that, um, that that's not the way you wanted it to be, was it something that was a, like, was it just like, this is how we're going to be and they're going to stay the way they were? Or did, was it noticeable amongst your, your family? I don't know if I'm asking that correctly because I'm trying to be. You know, I, would start, yep, I, I would start with that, with the, with the answer. It was myself and my brother, we ran, you know, two parallel different lives and lifestyles on how we, one, saw community to how we saw women in that mm -hmm. respect for women. And they were just completely, completely on two opposite spectrums. I pray for him. And I just go back to the mindset as people listen in and hear Jane, control the controllables. I can't control what my, my sibling is doing or has done mm -hmm. and vice versa. The only thing I can control is what I'm responsible for. I'll pray for my siblings and others, other family members. I'm not perfect by no stretch of the imagination, but just controlling the controllables. Right. But it lived out the research that I learned in high school and college and in right. the space that research is, hey, I'm two times as likely to be an abuser. If I saw all of those things played out, mm -hmm. came from the same household, raised by the same parents, grandparents, mother, and then there was just a difference, a difference in how we viewed society and relationships. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I am a uh, professional boundary setter. And mm -hmm. so uh, I made a decision you know, and this is even aside from Troy, there was a, a very particular way that I wanted my home mm -hmm. and an, env an environment that I wanted to set for my children and my husband. And that meant that there was just certain elements of the family I came from that were not welcome. Mm -hmm. And so for me, the the point where Troy is talking about control the controllables that did mean that there were some family functions that I did not take my children to because mm -hmm. I knew that when we got in those environments it was inevitable that something would transpire with someone or you know it could even be someone being verbally abusive sure. to one of us and I was not going to subject my children to that. And I never wanted to get them in the place where this was normal. And so in order for me to do that, I really had to be deliberate about creating those lines of demarcation so that it was very clear. And no, it was not something that was welcomed by all of my family members. And I was okay with that because not only was I choosing myself, mm -hmm. I was choosing my family. And I felt like I was doing something that I wish someone had done for me. Right, right. That's really, that's very impactful and important. You know, one of the things that we talk about when you talk about um, helping little, you know, young kids around these issues, if you really want to prevent it, you can start when kids are really young, but obviously you're not talking about, you know, sex and 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 you know those and romantic relationships you're talking more platonic so it's, it's what you talk to your kids it's about boundaries it's about respect right it's about you know conflict resolution and all those things so i you know i i i think that's really that's you know not a lot of people would be as um intentional as you are i commend you for that um so we that. did have a we did have a question um if both partners have been abused how sorry, I can move this over. How can they overcome the reactions? And so the question is individual therapy, couples therapy, both. I mean, you talked a little bit about it, but you know, do you have any other thoughts in particular? So I think it always starts with you first mm -hmm. because I love Troy, but I love me more. Mm -hmm. 
And so it's really important for me to get healthy. And in the process of me getting healthy, so if I'm whoever asked that question, it starts with you and you taking the time to do the healing that you need to do. That means, you know, if that means for you, you're choosing to go to get to counseling, to really talk through your experience so that your past is not driving your future. So you can understand what are my triggers? What are the things that I personally need to shed so that the abuse is still not winning in my life? Those were all things that I did personally. And in the process, what I recognized, there were some things in my relationship with Troy that needed to be addressed. Because while I may have reacted one way as a result of being the phys- the one that was physically abused, mentally abused, and Troy witnessed it, there still was an impression and an impact in his mind. And so his, his experience, it did play out in our relationship. So the being quiet and, 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 and retreating from conflict, that was not helpful either. And so it really was necessary for me to be able to come from my place of healing and say, Troy, I'm not doing this anymore, you know, and, and I'm asking you to address the aspects in you so that we can heal together and we're moving forward together um, because I wasn't opposed to moving forward alone if that's what was required but you know thankfully he and I have always been in this thing together and we had to get from the place where we were fighting um, each other and move into the space where we're fighting for each other and that's what we did right you know yeah. I'm oh, sorry just one thing Troy because it really was a, a vivid image for me the way you described it Tommy and you described it yourself Troy but Troy sort of retreating it makes you think of that little boy, right? The little boy, absolutely, were, right? And how you found making it safe for yourself. So it's very, I, I don't know, just sort of gave me goosebumps because it's really, it's because people tend, you know, if people tend to sort of forget about the kids, right? They think mm-hmm. about the person that's being abused. They think about your mom, Troy, but they forget that. And it's evident in what you said about you and your brother, you know, that you guys were victims too, whether mm-hmm. you were physically beaten or not um and you know that's very clear in how you respond in in you know how you had responded initially when when you and tommy got together and how you were responding to conflict um so i just wanted to point that out because it makes you you're no less of a victim because you weren't the one that was being physically abused and i would just add i'm all for and again this goes back to the individual on what that individual believes is best for him or her Mm -hmm to say release or to get to counseling i'm 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 huge on accountability partners and mm-hmm. confidants but i always go back to my lord and savior jesus christ and his word because people failed me men failed me women failed me my pastors failed me i had one one place and one person that i can always go back to and that was my faith mm-hmm. so but again, I'm not opposed to p- people have to find in their own heart what is best for them and who they can confide in mm-hmm. in this journey. And then, frankly, the accountability partners are super critical. I just yeah, never I got that. advice from single people. <laughs> I've never heard that expression. I really that's a really interesting expression. And is it is it mutual or do you think that everybody finds uh you know, like, is it, is it one person that you find you're, you're both accountable to each other or is it? So there's a group, there's a group of men in my life that we consider ourselves confidants of one another, also women, but for the most part, men, it's a, they're, they're men that we value the same thing. We see life the same way based off of some of our principles and things that we live by, but they're accountability partners. So I can't blow any smoke up there. You know, they're, they're not going for me giving them a lazy excuse. It is, you know, what would Christ say? And then we would get into it. Troy, you were wrong. Mm-hmm. That expression, that word, how you handle that. And the accountability is critical, but the accountability comes without judgment. So right. I know when I'm having that conversation, that conversation is between us. Mm-hmm. I don't have to worry about it going any other place. And they're not judging me any different, any right. less or more. So right. 
for me throughout my my entire life has been that way. But yeah. trying to find those accountability partners, those confidants, that's oh, hard. It's, it's less than a handful. Sure, sure. Also, what, Jane, what if I just want to add this for anyone who may be listening, because sometimes you don't know what to do, okay. especially if 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 what you're accustomed to doesn't point to resources or you're, you're falling short on identifying the answer. Mm -hmm. Now there are so many resources available in so many organizations like no more mm -hmm. where you can reach out to those organizations and you could say, Hey, I'm experiencing this and I don't know what to do. It's okay not to know what to do. It, it, it is because you're you're at a space where once you recognize I don't know, now you can find solution. Now you can find answer. So I think it's really important to understand that the resources that are available now in this space, there are so many organizations where you can go and you can, it, it's your starting point. You don't know what to do. You don't have to call this number, go to this organization. And we're here at the No More webinar. This is a resource. So right now you have an answer to getting started, to getting moving forward on your journey of healing. Right. Well, I will also put in a plug for the National Domestic Violence Hotline, I will say, because I've been long associated with them and I know you're the chair. But one of the things that, um, that I have heard across the many years I've worked with them is that a vast number of the calls are people who know someone and want to know what to do, right? Mm -hmm. Who see it in someone else. And that actually takes so much courage. And the reason is because once you sort of acknowledge that you know something, you sort of have to act on it, right? So if I have now calling the hotline and saying, what do I do? What can I do? You know, now I sort of have to do it. I've taken enough to your point accountability, Troy, to say, I see something doesn't feel right or isn't right. And now what do I do? How um you know, something you said before, it's really about trusting your gut, right? Like you probably, well, maybe I guess you didn't because you grew up in that environment. I was going to say, you probably knew on some level it wasn't right. Like on some level when you were younger that, that that's just not should, how it should feel. Or you really, really just think that what you grew up with was like, all right, this is it. Well, it was, it was normal because nobody, you have very few people that would help. So right. even when you're reaching out as a child, going from door to door, people know what's going on. They can hear through the walls. We're in an apartment building. But as life went on, not a but, but as life and as I matured, I really I really learned what, what today they deem as, you know, there was no such thing as like bystander intervention. Right. Like, what what is that? What was that in the 70s? Mm -hmm. Or bystander prevention. But today... You know, there's so many resources that Tommy alluded to, but when we talk about bystander, people reaching out because they know someone, the bystanders is the first person who is either has witnessed, someone has shared, or someone is sharing something, your instincts is telling you something's going wrong. There's a way to approach that conversation. There's a way to get that individual or individual's assistance or help because you are the first responder. And right. most of no, the first responder is not the 911 call. The mm -hmm. first responder is the first person that he or she is telling what is either happening or has happened. Mm -hmm. So um, I just say all that just to say today we're at a different place. Uh, there's still a vicious cycle, a war on women. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to see where there's progress, a lot of progress that has been made since I, as I would say, entered into the play, into this space in the early 70s. There's so many resources, you know, now nationally, there's a month, which I think, you know, I appreciate the month that people, you know, want to acknowledge and honor domestic violence, you know, awareness month, but this is an everyday, it's our issue. Mm -hmm. It's everybody issue and everyone plays a part and a role in it. Right. Well, I think, you know, you're, you're right. A lot of times people, you know, when, when we were growing up, it was nobody's business, right? Whatever went on behind closed doors, we stayed behind closed doors. And, you know, we sort of didn't acknowledge whatever you heard or saw. Um, mm -hmm. There was a, a, a really powerful PSA many years ago. I don't know if you remember it, but it was, it was you could, man um, could hear you know, this couple in bed and they could hear the fighting going on and the smashing and the terrible things. 
and they were there's a, a bedside table and there's a lamp and a phone and he's reaching over and you're like is he going to pick up the phone or is he going to turn off the light and he turns off the light and it was just this very like impactful like that was what society was doing right they were turning off the light and now we're trying to turn the light back on um we're we only have a few more minutes what um and I do have one question I really want to ask you, which is how did you, um, how do you think couples should, especially new couples, should it should start to have, I mean, how do you start to have these conversations, you know, as you, as you are with somebody when you're with them a longer time or you're starting to get married, you know, how do you, how do you, um, like, what do you, what do you recommend a new couple or a newly married couple do? in terms of trying to, to figure out, to negotiate what we just said, bringing your past, you know, your past comes with you wherever you go, right? And so how do you, how do you manage that in a new relationship? Mm -hmm. You had, uh, when you, before, when Troy was just talking, the question you had asked in regards to, did I know? Like I had to have some kind of inkling that something was going on. And when I consider that the hurt wasn't, the feeling that gave me pause. But when I think about it now, it's the fear. Mm -hmm. And that is a, that, that is a uh, indicator that something is not right because we should never be in relationships with other people and be afraid where love may have translated to me as hurt was part of the equation, that fear that I felt every single time, mm -hmm. that was something that would let me know this is, I'm afraid. Why am I afraid of someone that should be loving and caring for me? And so when you're getting into a new relationship, um, Troy and I did not do this, but I think that counseling prior to getting married would be a good idea because it gives you space in a neutral party to be able to talk about some things and put some things on the table where when you get married, there may be aspects of your life that you may not want to share because you feel a level of shame or embarrassment. I didn't talk about my abusive relationship because I was embarrassed at, right. for whatever reason I thought you know, I was stupid for being in a relationship with someone who was harming me. So why would I talk about that? Why would I share that? It wasn't a point of my life in which I was proud of. So if you have these spaces where you have a neutral party to engage with who will draw those conversations out, it gives you space to talk about it and to really put all the cards on the table. So then you could talk about triggers. You can talk about, you know, what communication styles and talk about how we're going to manage our resources, all the things necessary to move forward into a healthy relationship. So you give your marriage an opportunity to thrive. Right. Yeah. And, and I would say to it, to a young car, if I'm thinking about my younger self, mm -hmm. to Tommy's point, I think there's, always good to have you know someone that is ushering you through what potentially could be a trigger so i'm i'm all for you know whether it's a pastor whomever you confide in counseling and then but then also you have to realize that you're always not going to have a referee there mm. so you have to be able to deal with this with the two of you all so how do you have those conversations i call them just healthy conversations around things that just didn't work out, okay. but you set the table, you know, you can set the table to say, Hey, today, let's talk about these things because I don't want one to repeat what I did or two. I want to make sure I don't do something that in the past was something that harmed you. Mm -hmm. and I think just putting it on the table. And I talk about the referee because that third party, mm -hmm. Sometimes you get so comfortable that you always go back to that individual to try to solve the issue when really the issue has to be solved with the two, with, with you two in communication. At the end of the day, it's right. all about how you communicate and what you can communicate and showing empathy for one another mm -hmm. where you're having this conversation for the good of the relationship and you're not passing judgment. So there's yeah. a level of empathy that has to be on display at all times. But that's what I would say to my a younger self. Mm -hmm. I shared that with my, my son prior to him getting married. 
-hmm. share that with my daughter prior to her getting married. But you got to be able to put those things on the table because both of you all are carrying something. We all do. We all do. Of course. Right. That was great. I want to thank you guys so much for your time on a Sunday morning or afternoon. And I have had the privilege of knowing Troy for quite a long time, but knowing Tommy now for a few years. And I just, I am so grateful. And, you know, I, I, I guess I wish I were one of your kids because I really would have had a, a very good role model in terms of, of how to, how to, you know, be in a good relationship. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Those of you who tuned in. And uh, there's a whole long week of, of uh, no more dialogue series, the webinars, and there's some really cool ones coming up. So check out the website. Now I'm like a DJ. Um, check out the <laughs> website. And uh, thank you all and have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Jane. Thanks for thank having you. us. Take care. Bye.